Well, good morning. The passage that we'll be looking at this morning is in 1 Peter chapter 5, and you can go ahead and turn there if you would like. And as you do that, let me uh, remind you that tonight at 6.30, we'll be able to have a service outside at our church property on Mud Pike Road. Um, If you've never been to the church property, it's uh, about a half a mile off of Tyler as you turn onto Mud Pike. So you turn off of Tyler, go about half a mile down Mud Pike, and our property will be on the right, and you'll see a large uh, Christ Church sign. I think it says Future Home of Christ Church or something like that, and our property is right there on top of the hill. Uh, a reminder as well that if um, you, you are going to be there this evening, that you make sure you bring something to sit on if you're not going to be in your vehicle, um, a chair to sit on, otherwise you'll be sitting on the cold, rocky, dirty ground. Um, also a reminder that if you're a man, make sure that you will not need to use the restroom while you're there, because there will be a portable restroom, but it won't be for you. It will only be for the women and for the children. And also just a reminder that if you are not yet comfortable doing something like an outside service and being around so many people, um, we, we understand and we, we certainly don't want anyone to go against their conscience at this point or against anything that they would feel uh, comfortable with. So this morning, we're in 1 Peter chapter 5. Before we read that, we'll be in verses 5 to 7. But before we read chapter 5, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we thank you that you, in your mercy and in your grace toward us, have given us hearts to believe and eyes to see the greatness and the beauty of your Son. We thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might continue to know who he is and what he's done to a greater and greater degree. And we pray this morning, Lord, that in your mercy toward us again, you would cause our hearts um, to treasure and to revel in the greatness of Christ Jesus even more. We pray that as we open up the scriptures, Lord, you would shine the light of the gospel onto our hearts, that we would rejoice more completely in what you have done for us, and that our lives would be more completely pleasing to you and honoring to you. We thank you, Lord, that you've never once left us to ourselves, but you love us and you care for us, and you are, by your Holy Spirit, making us more like our Savior and our King, Jesus. And so we pray that you would cause that to happen this morning, and we pray that you would do that for Jesus' sake. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, again, we're in 1 Peter this morning in verses 5 to 7, and I'll go ahead and read all of 1 Peter chapter 5. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of sufferings are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon chosen together with you sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing and the preaching of his word. So this morning, as I mentioned, we're in verses 5 to 7. 
And I should clarify that we're in the second half of verse 5 through verse 7. And the reason why we're starting in the middle of a verse is because most likely Peter is beginning an entirely new thought when we get to the middle of verse 5. So if you look with me at verse 1 of chapter 5 here in 1 Peter, Peter addresses the elders. He says, I exhort the elders among you. And then in verses 1 through 4, he continues to address the elders, and he instructs them on how to be good and faithful uh, pastors and elders in the church. And then in the first part of verse 5, he says, you younger men. And so now he moves from addressing the elders to the younger men, and he says, you likewise be subject to your elders. But in the second half of verse 5, you notice that after now he's addressed the elders, and now after he's addressed the younger men, he says, all of you and all of you clothe yourselves with humility. And so he's moved, as you can see, from the elders to the young men, and now he broadens his address to the whole congregation, and he says, this is for you all, not just for the elders, not just for the younger men. This is for the whole church. You all need to see the importance of humility. So let me ask you then, as we get ready to look more into this passage, how are you doing and how seriously are you taking your fight against pride? Charles Spurgeon compared pride to weeds in a watered garden. And that's a great comparison. If you think about weeds in a watered garden, you water the garden, wanting the good plants to grow, and yet it pops up a weed there and you pluck it out. And then before you know it, there's another weed popping up over there, so you, you pluck that one out. And if you leave those weeds undealt with and unplucked, then what happens to any garden, no matter where you are, um, no matter what kind of garden you have, eventually the good plants can no longer grow as well as they, they used to, and soon the weeds overtake the entire garden. And that's the way that pride is. It takes constant awareness of our proneness to pride and a constant vigilance ready to pluck up and pull out the weeds of pride when we see them in our hearts in order to keep pride from finding root in our hearts and growing and spreading and finding a home there. So what kind of gardener are you when it comes to the pride of your heart, the weeds of pride that are so prone to grow in your heart? What kind of gardener are you? Are you allowing the weeds of pride to find a home there, or are you plucking them out when you see them and cultivating a heart of, of humility, a heart that grows the good fruits of grace? So Peter gives us exhortations to, to pursue humility, to be good gardeners of our hearts. He gives us the exhortation to humility in verse 5, the second, verse of, the second half of verse 5. Clothe yourselves with humility, he says. And then again at the end of verse 5, God gives grace to the humble. And then you see the same thing in verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And so clearly the theme of these verses that we're looking at now is humility. Peter wants us to see the importance of humility. And not only does he want us to see the importance of humility, he also wants us to see, see the incentive that we have to be humble. And so if you notice, not only does he give the exhortation to be humble, but he also gives us motivation and incentive. He says, be humble. And then as we'll see, he, he gives three reasons. And, and that'll be the outline for the sermon this morning. Three reasons why we should be humble. And the first is because God gives grace to the humble. And the second is because God exalts the humble. And then the third is because God cares for the humble. And so we'll follow that outline, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, this morning as we consider this theme of humility. So first, in verse 5, Peter exhorts us to be humble because God gives grace to the humble. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And what we'll, what we'll do in each of these three sections is first we'll look at the exhortation that Peter gives, and then we'll look at the incentive that he gives for that exhortation. So verse 5, the exhortation, what he wants us to do is to clothe ourselves in humility, toward one another. And there are a couple things that we need to see in order to understand what Peter means by humility. And so humility, it has the idea of lowliness of mind. It uh, literally describes us as having a deep sense of our own littleness, our own smallness, having a small view of ourselves. Uh, but it would be wrong to stop there. 
That's, that's not all that it means to be humble. Humility absolutely involves us having a small view of ourselves, an understanding of our sinfulness, an understanding of our littleness, but it involves a lot more than that as well. Think about it for just a second. If humility was defined only as having a low view of yourself, then this is what it would mean. You think small thoughts about yourself, you think about your own sinfulness and your own unworthiness, but at the end of the day, we're defining humility still just as you thinking about you. Yes, you're thinking about your smallness, but if that's all humility is, you're still just thinking about you. And that's the opposite of what humility is. Humility is not just having small thoughts about ourselves. <clears throat> it's about having less thoughts about ourselves. It's not just about seeing ourselves as, as lower and lower in our own eyes. We must do that. But it's giving up our obsession with ourselves. That's humility. Giving up our obsession with with ourselves. And that's the idea that Peter gets at when he says, clothe yourselves in humility toward one another. It's, it's directed away from us and toward others. So the idea is that we have a lowliness of mind with regard to others, in, specifically here in the church. Obviously, it applies to, to everyone, whether it's in the church or out of the church. But Peter's address here is specifically to those in the church. And the idea is that you have a lowliness of of mind, a low view of yourself with regard to your relationship with other individuals in the church. You put yourself in a position beneath them, putting them in a position of importance above you. That's, that's humility. And so it's not just thinking low thoughts about ourselves. It's about thinking less of ourselves in order to put others in a higher position in our regard or, or with regard to their importance to us. And then the, the verb that Peter uses here, it also communicates an important idea with regard to what humility is. He says, clothe yourselves in humility. At least in the NASB, that's how it's translated. Clothe yourselves in humility. And the verb in the original language has the idea of tying a garment around your waist, tying a garment around your waist. And the specific garment that's in mind is the servant's apron. And so a servant in a home would tie a particular kind of apron around his or her waist, not just because he needed it to serve, but because it served as a means of identifying him as a servant in the home. And so when he put this apron on, he was putting on the distinguishing mark of a servant. And that's the idea that Peter has here when he says, clothe yourselves in humility. What he's saying is, gird yourselves with this apron of humility. This, this apron that identifies you not as the one in the house that's there to be served, but as the one in the house that's there to put others before yourself and to serve them. So that's the idea that Peter's getting at. And, and a lot of people think that Peter maybe has in mind that last night before the crucifixion of Jesus in the upper room when Jesus girded himself with a towel and he knelt down and he washed the feet of his unworthy disciples in a sense, putting them above himself, taking the place of a servant. And perhaps that's what Peter has in mind here when he says that we're to put on this servant's apron of humility toward one another. And so clearly, humility is not just about you thinking low, bad thoughts about yourself. It's about you thinking less about yourself and about you thinking more of others and their, and their needs. So that's the exhortation. Now, as I mentioned, we'll talk about the exhortation in each, sec each section, and then move to the incentive for that exhortation. And so Peter, he gives the incentive. In the last part of verse 5, he says, For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God's opposition, or we, or we could say unreservedly, God's hatred of pride is found all over the Scriptures. A couple, couple of examples. These are a very, very small sample of God's hatred for pride in the Scriptures. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. That's, 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 compar that's exhaustive. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Or then we have examples in the scriptures of, of men like Herod in the book of Acts. And the people kept crying out before Herod, the voice of a God and not of a man. And Herod loved it. 
And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give, give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. And that's a pretty vivid picture of what God thinks about pride. They were saying, the voice of a God and not of a man. And Herod should have said, no, I'm just a man. There's one God. But he didn't. He was lifted up in his own heart in pride. And here's what the Lord thought about that. He struck him. He struck him dead, and he was eaten by worms. God hates pride. It's an abomination to him. And the word that Peter uses here in verse 5, opposed, God is opposed to the proud. That communicates this idea of, of hatred, of hostility. The, the idea with the word is one who is dressed or decked out in battle array, someone who is ready to go to war. That's the attitude that God has toward the pride of his creature. He dresses himself in battle array, and he prepares to go fight, to go to war against those who are lifted up with pride. And then on the other hand, God gives grace to the humble. To give grace means that God works in your favor rather than against you. He sets himself up to help you rather than destroy you. And these are two very opposite ideas, obviously. On the one hand, toward those who are lifted up in their pride, God is ready to go to war. And on the other hand, those who are clothed in humility, God positions himself to be their help and their support. And that makes perfect sense. If we think about what pride is, and we think about what humility is, then it makes perfect sense that God would be absolutely opposed to the proud and for and in support of the humble. The proud person sets up his ways against the glory of God, and God cannot be for something that is against his glory. And so God must be against the ways of the proud, absolutely. He cannot be for or in support of someone that sets himself up against the living God. And on the other hand, humility works not for our, ourselves, but for the glory of God. And so, of course, God is, is not going to set himself up against the purposes of an individual who's seeking God's glory. He's going to pour out his favor and his support and his help toward the one who is humble. And Peter says, this is the incentive for you to be humble. This, th this is why you ought to clothe yourselves in humility toward one another, you may not be noticed by others. You might not be recognized. You, you may never have a position of prominence among believers. You may never be seen for the things that you do. But here's the incentive for you to clothe yourself in humility. God sets himself up to pour out favor and support and help on those who are humble. There is so much incentive there, even when we just consider the negative aspect of God standing in opposition. But how much incentive there is in the positive light as well, that God pours out his grace on those who set themselves up humbly before him, not to serve themselves, but to serve others for the sake of Christ. Now, it's important to, to mention that God will never, in an objective sense, set himself against us as our enemy ever again if we are in Christ. God will never again reestablish the enmity that existed between us and him that was removed by the death of Christ. God will never become your enemy in that sense. But his attitude toward pride is still one of detestation. Even if it's in the life of a believer, God hates pride. And because he loves us and he hates the pride that is in us, he will do what, what we need him to do in order to purge us of the pride that's in our hearts. And so if we walk in obstinate pride, if we see pride in our hearts and yet refuse to deal with it and put, clothe ourselves with humility, then we can rightly anticipate that God will, in that sense, set himself up against us and against our pride through a process of discipline in order to cleanse us of it to cleanse us of the pride. And he'll do it because he loves you. He will withhold his grace and he will allow you to stumble. He will expose your weakness and he will demonstrate to you and possibly to others the foolishness of your pride. And he'll do it because he loves you and he wants you to live for his goals and his purposes for you and for his glory and not for your own selfish prideful interests. 
And so, yes, if we set ourselves up in pride against the glory of God, and we are his children, and because he loves us, he will drag us through a process of discipline. And so there's incentive not to do that, but to humble yourself, or to clothe yourself with humility toward others so that God will pour out his grace and help and not his discipline and opposition. So then we are to be humble because God gives grace to the humble. That's the first point. Then the second point, be humble because God exalts the humble. Be humble because God exalts the humble in verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. There's an important transition that takes place here in this verse. Uh, you, you may have noticed it. Verse 5, it says, Clothe yourselves in humility toward one another. So there's a, I guess it's a preposition there, toward. The direction of your humility is toward one another. But in verse 6, it's no longer toward one another, but under the mighty hand of God. And so the direction of humility has shifted from horizontal to vertical. It has to do not so much with our attitude toward one another, but with our attitude before God. And that's what's important to see is that is where all true humility begins. Humility never begins by us comparing ourselves to one another. Humility never begins on the horizontal level in its truest sense. Humility begins by us coming to a greater knowledge of the greatness of God. And as we come to a greater knowledge of the greatness of God, also seeing who we are compared to him. And nobody could ever be truly humble in a biblical sense toward others until they have been humbled or until they humble themselves beneath the greatness of our God. All true humility begins with you seeing who you are, sinful and small and hopeless outside of Christ, before a holy and an eternal and a mighty God. And so Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of of God. So ask yourself, do you have a humble heart before God? A little bit of context is helpful and important at this point in the sermon with regard to what Peter is dealing with in the rest of, of this letter of First Peter. This letter could really uh, be said to have, or it could be said um, with good reason, that, that the main theme of this letter is suffering. Let me give you some examples. 1 Peter chapter 1. If you want to turn back just a page or two with me. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. No, that's not right. I think it's verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Okay, so various trials. They're being distressed by various trials. Now go to chapter 2, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. In other words, Peter's saying, you, particularly the Christians receiving this letter, letter, but really applicable to all believers, you have been called to follow the example of Christ's suffering. You will suffer in similar ways in this world. And then chapter 3, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed... And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. And that if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, Peter's really saying there's a good chance that you'll suffer. Because many of the Christians are in the process of suffering as they read this letter. Even though you suffer for the sake of righteousness, Peter's saying. Then the beginning of chapter, one, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with this same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Christ suffered. Now you get ready, he's writing to the Christians, because you're going to suffer with him. And then verse, verses 12 to 13 of that same chapter, chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. 
If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. And then if we were to go just a few verses after our passage this morning, down to verse 10 of chapter 5, Peter writes, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And so you see them at chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5 of 1 Peter. They all reference suffering. All throughout this letter, from beginning to end, Peter is writing to a church or to multiple churches who are in the context of affliction. A fiery ordeal is how he words it in chapter 4. And when we get to chapter 5 and we read in verse 6, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. The mighty hand of God When Peter says that, he probably has in mind, in fact, it's it's very likely that he has in mind, their present suffering circumstances, their present trials. If we look at the way that the mighty hand of God is used in Scripture, it's a very Old Testament term. The mighty hand of God was used a lot in the Old Testament, and it references primarily God's, well, first his sovereignty over history, but particularly his sovereignty over the history of his people. And if you read the Old Testament, you see there's this ebb and flow of deliverance and prosperity and then suffering and even chastisement and then being lifted up again and then being cast down again. And the way that the scriptures speak of the mighty hand of God is that it's his hand that's both lifting them up and then subjecting them again to an experience of affliction and trial. And so when Peter here talks about the mighty hand of God, he probably has in mind the suffering that the Christians are experiencing that he's already referenced up to this point in the letter. So what that means is that the distress that he talked about in chapter 1, the suffering that he talks about in other chapters, the fiery ordeal that he talks about in chapter 4, the reviling that he talks about in chapter 4, the harm that he talks about in chapter 3, all of those things, Peter's saying, all of those things are the result of God's mighty hand at work in the life of these Christians. God's not the author of the evil, but he's certainly sovereign over it, and and it's his perfect wisdom that ordains this time of affliction for them. And in their present circumstances, they have one of two options. They can either buck up against his mighty hand, or they can humble themselves under it, recognizing his goodness and his faithfulness. So in other words, they can either grumble against him and get angry with him and doubt him, question his wisdom, act like they know better than him, and ultimately grow tired and disobey him. Or they can humble themselves beneath his mighty hand. They can quietly trust him and rest in his goodness and trust in his wisdom and recognize that this mighty hand that has brought about their current circumstances is the mighty hand of a good and faithful God. And even if he brings momentary afflictions, He always works for the good of his people. And that's where Peter goes with regard to the incentive. That's the exhortation, humble yourselves. But then he gives the incentive because God exalts those who humble themselves. Let me just mention that humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God is made very difficult by our often distrusting hearts. Because we are prone to think that we know what we need in our lives at any point in time, it makes it difficult. It's sin, but it makes it difficult for us to bow down before the mighty hand of God and trust him. So when we're living in chronic pain, or when you're single and you long to be married, or when you're childless and you long for children, or when you're sick and you're not getting any better, or when you've been hurt by family members, or when you've lost your job, it is easy for us to think that that's the wrong thing to happen. That shouldn't be. And yet, what Peter is exhorting us to do here is to humble ourselves and recognize that we don't know what we need. And God does, and we can trust him, and we can quietly rest in his goodness, and we can do it Because we know that all who humble themselves before him, yes, who experience severe and serious affliction, all will also be exalted at the proper time. 
the one who willingly humbles himself beneath the mighty hand of God now will also be raised up by that same mighty hand. And that's the pattern of thought we see all throughout the scriptures. We see it in Jesus' life. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And for this reason, because he humbled himself, God also exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. And then Jesus, in his own teaching, he says the same thing. Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Or we see it in the examples of Old Testament figures, people, historically, like Hannah. So if you remember Hannah in 1 Samuel, beginning of 1 Samuel, she's barren. She can have no children, and she humbles herself before the Lord, and she cries out to him in the temple, and the Lord hears her prayer, and he grants her a child. And then listen to what Hannah says in response. She says, the Lord makes poor, in other words, he, he humbles, and he makes rich. He brings low, and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. That's the idea that Peter has in mind here when he says, yes, humble yourself now under the mighty hand of God. Trust him in your affliction. Be humbled. But know that that same hand that humbles you, it will also raise you up like it raised Jesus up, like it raised Hannah up. It will raise you up as well. And yet, there's a very important phrase there at the end of the verse, at the proper time. He will exalt you at the proper time. And the bad news is, we don't get to determine when that proper time is. We don't get to say, I think now is a good time for this affliction to stop, for this trial to come to an end. But the good news is that the one who does determine when your affliction comes to an end, when you being brought low comes to an end, and your trial ceases, the one who does determine that is perfect in his wisdom. And he never, ever makes a mistake. He, he, he cannot have any flaw in his sovereign orchestration of your life. It's impossible. He is good, and only goodness flows from him. And so, humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God in your affliction looks like trusting him. Trusting that in his timing, not yours, but in his timing, he'll also exalt you. He'll bring you out. He will raise you up. And it's possible that Peter has in mind here for the Christians that he's writing to at a, a point in this life when their afflictions will come to an end, that God will exalt them out of their trial and possibly lift them up above those who are reviling them. And it's possible that that might be the case for us, that maybe in this life, in a sense, God will raise us up out of our affliction and our trial will come to an end, maybe next month, maybe in a year, maybe in a few years. But in the ultimate sense, what Peter is saying is that at the proper time, referring to when Christ returns, all of the people of God will be gathered together with him and exalted together with him in glory. That's what Colossians 3 says. When he's revealed, we'll be revealed with him in glory. And so there's no guarantee at all. There's no guarantee that life will get easier now. There, there's no guarantee that this life, this side of the return of Christ, will get easier for you. I'm not saying that we can't trust or even believe or hope with confidence that God will bring our trial to the end. I think we can. God is not out to make our life miserable. That's not his goal. But there's no guarantee that that will happen. The only guarantee we have is that when Christ returns, at that point, we will also be lifted up with him. We will be raised up together with the Son of God. We will live with him in the new heavens and in the new earth where there is no affliction, where there is no being brought low in the sense of trials and sufferings and revilings, where there's only joy, we will be raised out of suffering and into a life of eternal joy together with Christ. And so Peter's saying, humble yourselves now, trust God in your circumstances now, and look forward to that day when in his mercy he lifts you up together with his son. Live in light of the coming of Christ, the day when you will be exalted with him out of your suffering and out of your trial. So humble yourself, be humble, because God gives grace to the humble and because God exalts the humble. And then lastly, humble yourself because God cares for the humble. So verse 7, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 
Once again, we'll look at the exhortation, and then we'll look at the incentive for the exhortation. The exhortation is casting all of your anxiety on him. Cast your anxiety on the Lord. Anxiety, here it refers, that paints a picture of, of someone who's pulled in all different directions by worries and fears of potential harm or potential danger. And, and that describes a worrisome person, I think, pretty well. Someone who's constantly pulled in different directions because of the next thing they have to be afraid of, worried about. And their hearts, because they're constantly being pulled in, in all these different directions by worry, their hearts are never quiet. They're never still. They're never resting. They're always being dragged here or there. And Peter says that we're to take the anxieties that drag us around, drag us here and there, pull us in different directions. We're to take all of those anxieties and we're to cast them on the Lord. Lo and Nita, who are, um, they have a, a lexicon, a Greek lexicon, they, they describe this word to cast this way. They say it's to put responsibility on or to make responsible for. We are to make the Lord responsible for all of our worries. The only other place that this verb to cast is used is in Luke chapter 19, the gospel of Luke chapter 19 and verse 35. And it's leading up to Jesus' triumphal entry. And the disciples, they go and they find him a colt and they take off their jackets and they throw their jackets on the colt before Jesus mounts. And, and that's the same word. To throw their jackets on the colt is to cast here in 1 Peter 5. They take the jackets off of themselves and they lay it on the colt. And that's a great picture of what it is for us to cast our anxieties off of ourselves and onto the Lord. We take them out of our own control, out of our own responsibility, and we lay them on the one that we're called to trust. And if you notice, my outline doesn't exactly match the, the verse. So if you look at verse 6, sorry, verse 7, there's no mention of humility there, but in my outline, this third section is called Be Humble because God cares for the humble. But if you look through verse 7 with me, there's no mention of humility. But there's a reason that I've worded my outline that way. Uh, it's not just to uh, have repetition. There's, there's, there's a reason for it. And if you have any translation, I think, other than the NIV, verses 6 and 7 are one sentence. The NIV breaks it at the end of verse 6 and starts a new sentence at verse 7, but um, it's really just one sentence. And so the exhortation is verse 6, humble yourselves, and then Peter is continuing that same thought of humbling ourselves when he says, casting all your anxiety on him. And so another way that we could think about it would be, humble yourselves by casting all of your anxieties on him. Or humble yourselves as you cast your anxieties on him. It's all one act. It's all one movement of our hearts. Humility is moving, or one expression of humility is moving toward the Lord and casting our anxieties on him. And there's a reason I'm making such a big deal of that. It's because we have to see, in order to understand what Peter's saying, we have to see the connection between humility and casting our anxieties on the Lord. Between the humble person and the person who casts their anxieties on the Lord. What Peter's saying is that if we are humble and if we are living in humility, we will be casting our anxieties on the Lord. The humble person is the person who realizes, I'm too weak and too small and too incapable of bearing my own anxieties. <laughs> I can't do anything with them. I can't solve my problems. And the only person I can go to who has the power to bring about my good and his glory is God. And so I'm going away from myself and to the one who cares for me, and I'm casting my anxieties on him. That's humility. And the opposite is also true. The failure to cast your anxieties on the Lord is pride. It's an expression. It's, it's, a, it's actually a blatant evidence of pride in your heart. It's you thinking in some way or another that you can handle your problems on your own, your anxieties on your own. It's you thinking that you can go somewhere other than the Lord to find a solution to, to your needs. And that's just pride. Even though we, we give a, a lot of different reasons why we don't cast our anxieties on the Lord, like our problems are too trivial or too mundane or I shouldn't even be struggling with this to begin with, or, or any other number of reasons. Really, at the end of the day, the reason you don't cast your anxieties on the Lord is because you are prideful. The pride of your heart makes you think, for whatever reason, that you don't need to throw them on God. So the person who is humble is the person who takes his anxieties off of himself, casts them on the Lord, 
And Peter says the incentive for doing that is because God cares for you. He cares for you. Why should you cast all of your anxieties on the Lord? Because he cares for you. One commentator, Hebert, he says this, All that creates anxiety for us, whether momentous or trivial, is a matter of concern to him. All that creates anxiety for us, whether momentous or trivial, is a matter of concern to God. That's, that's, if you think about it, that's an incredible statement coming off of verse 6, where Peter has just described God's hand as his mighty hand. And so what Peter's saying is that same mighty hand that governs history and determines every single one of your circumstances is the same mighty hand that cares for you, the one who's, who makes your anxieties his concern. Again, let me quote Hebert because this is really good. He says, It's the belief that God cares that marks off Christianity from every other religion, which under all varieties of form, all these other religions are occupied with the task of making God care, of awakening by sacrifice or prayer or act the slumbering interest of a deity. That's what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. You don't have to make God care. He cares for you. He loves you. That's what the gospel is all about. If you want to know, how can I know that God cares for me? You look back at the cross where Christ died for you, and you remember, he cared for me when I was his enemy. He sent his son to die for me when I didn't love him. I didn't want anything to do with him. He cared for me by saving me from my eternal consequence of the eternal consequences of my sin, which is hell. He saved me from those things. And so I can believe and trust and rest in the fact that if he cares for me in that, he cares for me in much smaller things as well in this life. God cares for you. You don't have to make him care for you. He loves you. You're his. You belong to him. You're his child. A father does not need to be provoked, at least not a good father does not need to be provoked into caring for his child. And so, be humble because God gives grace to the humble. Be humble because God exalts the humble. And be humble because God cares for the humble. And just in conclusion, let me make one final comment or observation. The question for all of us, the question for you this morning, is not whether you will be humbled. The question for all of us and the question for you is when and how will you be humbled? The, the scriptures, the gospel, they give us only one of two options, and you have only one of two options. You can either humble yourself willingly now before this great and mighty God, recognizing that apart from the Savior he sent to die for you, you have no hope. You can humble yourself now and trust in Jesus, and repent of your sins, and follow him, or in your pride, you can put Christ off, leave him to the side, refuse to bow your knee and worship before him, and you will be humbled in the day of judgment. Those are the only two options that scripture gives you. Either humble yourself now before Christ, or be humbled by Christ in judgment. And so have you ever humbled yourself before this Christ? Have you ever brought yourself low before this great God? I'm not asking if you struggle at times to put pride to death. Every Christian does to some degree. I'm not asking if there are still evidences here and there of remaining pride in your heart. I'm asking, have you ever turned away and are you turning away now from your own self-righteousness once and for all, to trust in Christ? Have you given up on self-reliance because you've realized there's no good in you to rely upon? And have you come humbly before this God, recognizing that Christ alone deserves your praise and your life and your obedience? That's, that's what I'm asking. Have you humbled yourself before this God? Take Peter's exhortation seriously. God stands in battle array against those who are filled with pride. And he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself beneath God's mighty hand that he might exalt you at the proper time. And humble yourself now with all of your cares, all of your anxieties, taking them 
and casting them on the God who cares for you and sent his son to die for you. Let's pray. God, we are thankful that even though we are often prone to pride and even though we lived lives of pride, we're thankful that you sent Christ to die for us, to save us from that pride and to make us more like him and his humility and to bring us before him bowed down in worship. And Father, we pray that you'd give us grace that we might humble ourselves more fully before your Son, before your greatness, that we would be more filled with the hope, God, of the grace that you give to the humble, of the exaltation that awaits the humble, of the care that you provide for the humble. Fill us, Lord, with the confidence and the hope that belongs to us because of Christ. And I pray, Lord, for those who listen to this sermon and are yet without Christ and have not yet humble themselves before him. Lord, would you bring real conviction upon their hearts that they might see the greatness of your son and his worth and their need to bow before him. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.